you all for coming, especially when there's a lot of uh, very interesting and quite diverse uh, concurrent talks going on. Um, so, we all know that LSD has pronounced effects on various facets of perception, and I think what's often kind of not really um, given enough attention is how this may influence um, underlying neurophysiological models of different facets of perception. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, two different strands of perceptual phenomena, in particular synesthesia and time perception. So there's been a lot of attention over the last few decades about how LSD might induce synesthesia in individuals that do not have that. Right? So synesthesia, for you that are not familiar with, it is some type of cross-modal effect in which um, one, an inducer will produce a concurrent experience that the rest of us do not have. So sound may elicit color experiences, or numbers or letters may induce color experiences. Okay, so this is an interesting, um, synesthesia is interesting for researchers, uh, sorry, LSD induced synesthesia is of interest to researchers studying synesthesia because most models of synesthesia argue that it's driven by underlying structural connectivity that is basically inborn when an individual is born, okay? So basically, an LSD produced synesthesia has implications for disinhibition models of synesthesia. So disinhibition models of synesthesia argue that normally um, a grapheme or a sound will produce color experiences, but this will be inhibited in individuals. So there are underlying latent connections between the inducer and the concur, but these are normally inhibited in healthy uh, non-synesthetes. Whereas the idea is that LSD or other drugs that produce synesthesia may disrupt this inhibition, giving rise to synesthetic experience. So the question of whether LSD does induce genuine synesthesia has important implications for contemporary models of synesthesia. Next, LSD is also known to have impacts on interval timing, so time perception, the milliseconds to minutes range. Okay. Um, most research that has studied or discussed LSD distorted timing has kind of focused on the serotonin system. But this is in contrast to contemporary neurophysiological models of interval timing, which largely focus on the dopaminergic system. So there's pronounced evidence for the role of dopamine in interval timing. So further understanding the kind of neurochemical and neurophysiological substrates of LSD-induced distorted timing, this can then in turn further inform models of time perception. So today I'm going to be talking again just about first I'm going to describe one study that we did on LSD-induced synesthesia and then a second study on examining how a microdose LSD may impact time perception. So as I described earlier, there's um, a, uh, uh, a substantial amount of literature that seems to suggest LSD produces spontaneous synesthesia-like experiences. Okay. One open question though is to what extent is this specific to LSD or other serotonin agonists? So David and I did a survey a few years ago which we're in the process of finishing up. And there's a large, a, we uh, studied um, drug users and surveyed them about their experience of synesthesia under different drugs. And what I want to basically just highlight here is that the incidence of drug-induced synesthesia is most pronounced amongst tryptamines such as LSD, psilocybin, and so on. So this kind of does seem to suggest there might be a specific effect um, within this domain. And importantly, we find the effects, um, these incidence rates correspond with enhancement rates in synesthetes as well. So if we look at how these same drugs, they actually seem to enhance this, the congenital synesthesia of people who are normally kind of born with synesthesia, suggesting that, again, potentially implicating serotonin in uh, synesthesia. And then another strand of research, uh, we did a survey of all the studies looking at drug-induced synesthesia. And what we find is there's a, an important commonality in that most of them are seen producing sound, visual, or sound color synesthesia. And we also found this in our survey as well. So sound color synesthesia in particular seems to be an important kind of spontaneous effect or consequence of LSD and other psychedelics. So the first study we did here uh, include, was a pilot study involving um, 10 healthy adults. Okay, all had a prior experience of psychedelics. Okay, this study was uh, piggybacking on research by uh, Robin Carhart Harris's and David Nutt's group at Imperial. Okay, so it's a within groups design contrasting placebo and LSD on separate days. Okay, um, here's the dosage of 40 to 80, 80 micrograms. Okay, which was intravenously infused over a three minute period. Okay, the participants underwent extensive uh, medical and psychiatric screening and there are no negative effects of, in participation in the study. 
Now, there are a large range of different of, of measures that were included in the study. I would suggest you take a look at uh, Robin's studies, um, particularly um, from that period. Okay? Uh, but the ones that we're interested in were those that um, focus on synesthesia, of course. So first, we include just a simple self-report measure of synesthesia to get at this idea of whether the effects are basically just spontaneous or if they mirror the effects that we see in congenital synesthetes in terms of established behavioral measures of synesthesia. So self-reported synesthesia. We also looked at graphene color associations. So we just presented a simple task in which participants were presented on a computer monitor of graphene, so numbers and letters, okay? And then they had to look at a color palette and choose a specific color that correspond to any experience they might have. And they had to specifically state whether they actually had a color experience in response to those graphemes, okay? So graphene color synesthesia, although not a common um, effect of drug-induced synesthesia is the most commonly um, common and widespread and most widely studied form of congenital synesthesia. So that's the reason why we want to specifically look at that. Uh, we also, sorry, looked at uh, the most common form of drug-induced synesthesia, which is sound color synesthesia. So we present a wide range of different sounds, had them report whether they had experiences of color, and then also to identify the specific colors. Okay? And this study was published uh, last year. Okay, so the first thing I want to report here is we're able to, from this task, we're able to derive a number of different measures that we know are, um, are able to discriminate congenital synesthetes from non-synesthetes in, in uh, other studies. I'm not reporting it here, but what I should just state is that the, um, in the LSD condition, participants re did report pronounced spontaneous experiences of different forms of synesthesia, thereby corroborating that extant literature, okay? But what happens when we look at kind of more formalized measures? So first, just in response to graphemes and sounds, we found the LSD condition, they do report more color experiences, okay, in this actual behavioral task, okay? But these effects did not achieve statistical significance were really quite far off, okay? There is clearly a kind of a trend, but it's definitely not robust whatsoever, okay? So the next thing we were interested in was inducer specificity. So congenital synesthetes will often have the effects be more pronounced to particular inducers, so particular numbers, particular sounds, and so on. So we want to investigate this question as well. So within this, lower values here reflect greater inducer specificity. So we do um, find that L in the LSD condition, they reported greater or exhibited greater inducer specificity, thereby mirroring what we see in congenital synesthetes. But again, as you can see, these effects are clearly not robust whatsoever. Okay? And finally, we looked at consistency. So consistency is often regarded as the hallmark characteristic of congenital synesthesia. So synesthetes will report pronounced consistency between of number color associations, sound color associations, and so on. So on this measure, lower values reflect greater consistency. And what you find is that in the LSD condition, they're actually less consistent. So the exact opposite effect that you'd see in congenital synesthetes. Okay? This effect, again, did not achieve statistical significance, but again, I just want to highlight it's in the opposite direction than you'd predict if we're producing genuine synesthesia here. Okay? So one problem with this is we just looked at consistency overall. We didn't look at consistency when the participants were actually reporting color experiences. So if we go back and we do within participant regression analyses, and examine whether the experience of color, so when they actually experience color, are they more consistent in their associations then? Um, and basically we find that there's no effect there as well. Okay. So I just want to highlight uh, just a few things. So basically LSD did produce spontaneous synesthesia-like experiences, thereby corroborating the extant literature. Okay. But LSD-induced synesthesia did not meet established criteria for synesthesia. Okay? This does not seem to actually kind of meet the, the standard criteria for what we know uh, that we know synesthetes exhibit in standardized behavioral measures. Okay? Now, one potential confound here is that standard markers of synesthesia may arise from a process of consolidation. So this is something that David Luke and I proposed a few years ago. And specifically, the idea is that it may be that synesthete, congenital synesthetes have to have these repeated pairing of their inducer and concurrence, their sound color associations over time and perhaps many years before they get these pronounced levels of consistency. And there is some indirect evidence for this idea. So for instance, children with congenital synesthesia have lower consistency than adults with congenital synesthesia. So it might be that consistency is kind of an artifact of consolidation. So we're in the pro early stages of um, investigating this further. We actually have a very interesting case study that we're in an early stage of investigating of an individual who seems to have um, 
permanent synesthesia in the wake of a psychedelic overdose. And so we're going to examine, he's had this for a few years, so this then allows us to examine whether those have, um, the associations have been consolidated over time and thereby would mirror what you see in congenital synesthesia. Okay. But the take home message is here, I think we need to be a bit more cautious when we talk about LSD inducing synesthesia because it does not exhibit the same standard uh, characteristics as what we see in congenital synesthesia. Okay. Of course, there are a number of limitations here. Okay. The sample size is very small. This was a preliminary kind of feasibility study, but it nevertheless is, a com of course, potentially underpowered. Although some of the effects are in the opposite direction, as you'd predict, so that would kind of go against maybe a power interpretation. <coughs> There's obviously a potential concern here with participant masking. Okay. So obviously, uh, the effects of LSD on conscious states are very pronounced, and so participants are easily able to identify which condition they're in. So there's a strong potential then here for demand characteristics, suggestibility, and other types of factors to influence their performance. Okay? But we would argue this actually probably strengthens the observations because if, if these people think, if they know they're under in the LSD condition and they think that that's going to produce synesthesia, they're more likely to report pronounced color experiences, which we did not observe. So we think this actually kind of strengthens our claims here. Sorry, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, so now um, I'm going to describe um, another la uh, line of research where we've been examining how LSD may impact uh, interval timing, so time perception in the milliseconds to seconds range. Okay, so a wide range of studies have, ex um, um, have examined how LSD impacts our perception of time, and this is often seen, you, just, you hear this described in different types of review papers in this literature, and time perception is actually a very fundamental component of cognition and perception, so it's closely intertwined with updating of conscious states is closely linked with working memory, attention, and enables a number of complex um, functions from language to motor control and so on. So it's a relatively, relatively important uh, psychological function for us to study and it may actually influence or contribute to other effects of LSD on different types of psychological functions. So the research in this domain, at least in humans, tends to be much older. Okay? Um, there's a couple of nice studies, one by Aronson, for instance, in the late 50s, which show that LSD seemed to produce temporal contraction of long intervals ranging from 15 to, uh, to 240 minute intervals. Okay? Um, here's the dosage um, effects here. This is just against um, relative to baseline in a relatively small sample, though. Okay? Other results have been inconclusive, so a nice study by Metroni and colleagues in the late 70s actually found no robust effects of LSD on interval timing. So there's a little bit of kind of mixed findings in this literature. Okay. One concern we have with this literature is that most of the studies are relying on self-report measures of time perception. And if we kind of look back to the synesthesia, then that is a potential concern. So if people are reporting these subjective effects, we don't know if these actually translate to more robust behavioral measures. That's, that's something we need to be concerned about. Also, very few of these studies have included robust designs, okay? such as placebo control, random assignment, and so on and so forth. Okay? There are two further important confounds, and that is that if we try to understand how LSD may influence interval timing, we need, need to dissociate its neurochemical basis from altered states of consciousness. So if LSD is producing altered states of consciousness because of the close link between timing and consciousness, any effects on time perception may be largely attributable to altered states of consciousness rather than a kind of the underlying neurochemical modulation. Okay? So it's important to kind of separate those effects out. Okay? We also know from recent research that LSD seems to have biphasic properties. So its early stage seems to function more as a serotonin agonist, whereas at later stage it seems to func function as a dopamine agonist. And this is especially important when we go back to the neurophysiological literature on time perception for which uh, dopamine is most widely implicated. This is especially important because um, there's a really nice study by Mark Whitman where they used high-dose psilocybin um, relative to placebo, and they found that this led to temporal contraction. So participants tended to underestimate time when they're on psilocybin. So this effect was restricted to 4,000 to 5,000 milliseconds. So in the placebo condition, you see there's no effect across different time scales from 0 minutes to 90 minutes to 240 minutes in the placebo condition. Whereas over time, from 90 minutes to 240 minutes, you start to see underestimation in a kind of a standard temporal reproduction task in the psilocybin condition. This is of interest because dopaminergic effects on timing have the exact opposite effect. So there's robust evidence from animal studies and human studies that dopamine agonists actually lead to temporal dilation, so tendency to overestimate time. 
Okay? And this just kind of fits in with the classic kind of nidrostriatal dopamine pathway, which has been widely implicated in interval timing. So an example of this is a study that we did uh, last year, or published last year, where we looked at spontaneous blinking. So spontaneous blinking is a reliable biomarker of striatal dopamine. So um, blinking is uh, often um, uh, driven by transient upregulations in striatal dopamine. So if you look at this on a trial by trial basis, what you can see is that participants tend to overestimate time after they blink, okay? So there's this kind of transient increase in striatal dopamine, okay, that triggers a blink, okay, and there that can then be used as a marker of striatal dopamine, and what we see is they tend to then overestimate time, which is consistent with what we know about dopamine agonists influencing interval timing. So just to kind of reiterate, there's very robust evidence that dopamine agonists seem to kind of produce temporal overestimation, okay? So this study, uh, this study was uh, based, um, was run by Eleusis Pharmaceuticals, and they allowed us, thankfully, to uh, piggyback on the study and um, study time perception in this, in this context. So here they have 48 healthy older adults, okay, ranging from 55 to 75 years of age. Um, approximately half of them were female, okay. Just a little about the design. Um, so it's a 28-day screening period where they underwent extensive medical and psychiatric screening. There was a three-week uh, dosing period, which I'll describe in a moment and then a four-week follow-up period, okay? So participants um, were randomly assigned to either placebo condition or 5, 10, or 20 microgram dose of LSD, okay? So we're interested in microdosing because this allows us to circumvent the issue of altered states of consciousness, okay? So if, they're not, if the drug is not producing this robust change in you know, overt subjective perceptual states, but we still might see changes in interval timing, then we can have a greater license to infer the effects are not attributable to altered states of consciousness. Okay, the dose was received um, every three days, so six times total. Sorry, um, and this is a study that we're um, on the verge of submitting. So we also, um, they also measured subjective drug effects with 22 different questions that were administered regularly throughout the day. So this allows us to get a sense of the time point where we actually administer the task um, to what extent were they reporting kind of distortions in um, conscious states during that period, okay? So then again, to address that confound of altered states of consciousness. So we use a standard temporal reproduction task. So what happens is participants are presented with an interval on the screen, so it might be like a blank screen or a, um, a circle on the monitor, and then there's a response prompt triggering them to hold down the space bar and reproduce that same interval, okay? So it's a very, we use this because it's a very simple um, task and very well established. It was also used by Mark Whitman and other people doing psychedelic research on interval timing. And this was completed on the fourth dosing day for practical reasons. Okay. So first I just want to report the subjective drug effects uh, in this study. So here we're contrasting just placebo and LSD. Um, there were 22 questions, but here I'm reporting the five questions that are of greater re greatest relevance to this study. Okay. Now the main thing I want to highlight is that there's no, effect, no differences between the placebo and LSD um, um, conditions overall in the different drug effects. There tends, to be a, uh, there tends to be an effect here around um, 120 minutes, 180 minutes, where the LSD, uh, participants in the LSD condition tend to report um, greater subjective drug effects, but these effects do not achieve statistical significance. No effects, no differences between perceptual distortions, unusual thoughts, uh, feeling high, um, or just their overall general concentration, okay? So this is fairly important, so they're not exhibiting robust alterations in consciousness during the period where we're actually administering the task. So this black line designates when we actually administer the task, and the gray bars reflect a 95% confidence region, okay? Now what's important is um, LSD is known, or is believed to function as a dopamine agonist more in the range of kind of 60 to 90 minutes and later on. So we're basically clearly kind of targeting more of this dopaminergic phase rather than a serotonergic phase. This just leads to a very clear cut prediction that they should overestimate time during this period. And this is just very briefly, these are just the different doses. Again, there are no significant effects. You can see at 20 micrograms, there's a tendency for the participants to report greater drug effects during this time window, but again, it did not achieve statistical significance. Okay. So our central prediction that LSD would lead to temporal dilation was supported. So we measured intervals ranging from 800 to 400, 4,000 milliseconds. And what you see is that in the LSD condition, they, they overproduce the intervals um, from this range of 2,000 to 4,000 milliseconds. And the effects are fairly robust and fairly consistent. Okay. 
We include another measure of the coefficient of variability, which basically provides a measure of response variability or temporal precision. Okay. And we find no effects there. So basically it seems that LSD is not actually impairing their time perception or making them more variable, okay? even though it is producing this temporal dilation effect. Okay. Um, and this basically is just a within participant regression analysis where we fit a least squares line to the data within each participant and look at the beta coefficients. What, what this basically shows is that in the LSD condition, they have steeper slopes of their reproduced intervals. And you can see this, it's just a bit steeper here than the placebo condition. When we look at the dose effects, there were not robust dose effects, but there were a few uh, significant effects, primarily actually pertaining to 10 micrograms versus a placebo. Um, and again, no effects and temporal precision. Uh, we would suspect that some of these effects are probably a bit weaker because we're working with smaller sample size. We only have 12 participants in each condition at that point. Again, we do rep replicate that uh, steeper slope um, in the LSD conditions relative to placebo. Okay, so again, this kind of suggests a role for dopamine and LSD-mediated distorted timing, thereby further kind of corroborating what we know about how dopamine agonists may influence perception of time. Importantly, we think the design circumvents limitations of previous research on LSD and interval timing, most notably lack of placebo controls, random assignment, and so on. We also think it, it um, helps us address this potential confound of altered states of consciousness within the time perception uh, study. Obviously, there are important limitations, most notably the sample size. We did have 48 participants in the total study, which is not bad, but we believe the dose effects may have been underpowered. So we, I don't want to make strong claims about any kind of dose effects at this stage. Also, importantly, we have no baseline measurement or um, this is a potential concern, of course. We don't think this is a huge issue because the, there was random assignment to conditions. Nevertheless, having a baseline assessment of t the, on the temporal reproduction task would have allowed us to make greater inferences here. Also, we would have very much liked to have measurement at multiple time points. This would allow us to more precisely identify this dissociation between serotonergic and dopaminergic phases of the drug. So we would expect during those early phases, for instance, that LSD would lead to temporal underestimation. But during that dopaminergic phase, as we observed here, we would expect temporal dilation. Okay. Participant masking is a potential concern. We think this is unlikely, but of course it is possible, so we can't discount that completely. So they may have become aware that they were um, in an LSD condition. To what extent they would have demand characteristic associated expectations, though, to overestimate time, I think is very, is very unclear. Okay, and then of course there's the sample demographics. So this study was restricted to older adults. Now we're interested in this because um, older adults exhibit uh, reduced stridal, um, stridal dopamine receptor activity, okay? Um, and they also exhibit re um, temporal contraction on standardized temp um, temporal perception tasks. So we think that this kind of allowed us greater sensitivity to pick up on these effects, but there's always the potential that they are restricted to this population. Okay, okay so just briefly to summarize, so LSD-induced synesthesia does not meet established criteria for this condition, okay? Um, some, of these, some of those standard markers, such as consistency, though, may be attributed, attributed to, to consolidation processes. Nevertheless, we do think it's important to be cautious when we talk about LSD-induced synesthesia. I think a lot of researchers have made very strong claims. Dave and I once found a paper showing, saying that uh, you know, LSD, where they, they quote said, LSD causes synesthesia. So we think these types of claims are overly strong. We need to be a little more cautious and definitely focus more on more robust behavioral tasks, even though we do need to take into account some of these potential confounds in future studies. Okay. We further find that microdose LSD seems to produce temporal dilation on established tasks. Okay. Um, again, this is circumventing a number of confounds in, pre in the previous literature. And it does fit very nicely with um, a wide range of evidence implicating dopamine in interval timing. Okay. And importantly, we believe this circumvents the potential confound of altered states of consciousness um, disrupting inter or altering dis um, interval timing. So we think the effects are probably not mediated by just alterations in consciousness, but might be a direct effect of, of dopamine on kind of a, a frontal, uh, sorry, a nidrostriatal pathway, which is again known to be implicated in interval time. Okay, so I'd just like to acknowledge uh, colleagues, um, uh, most notably, uh, uh, Robin Carter Harris and David Nuff from Imper Imperial to allow us to kind of um, take uh, um, um, use our measures of synesthesia in their task and also Nilafar and Luke from Eleusis to allow us to piggyback and do uh, um, time perception within that within their study as well.
Um, and very briefly, I'm the associate editor of Consciousness and Cognition. Um, so I'd just like to kind of highlight the journal as a potential outlet for research on psychedelics. So we do um, infrequently publish research on psychedelics pertaining to consciousness. And this might be a potential outlet for your future research. If anyone wants to talk to me about that later on, I'll be around for a bit. Um, thank you for your attention.